Ghost in the Shell's a legendary animated feature, a piece of work that reaches the heights of the French artists, American authors, and English directors that it was inspired by. It elevated an already renowned manga series into an international sensation. The name is still going today with multiple comics, novels, films, television shows, and of course, video games. But whereas Ghost in the Shell is a brand that's prominent in manga, television, and film, it's never reached the acclaim and discussion in gaming. Despite having releases that date back to 1997, there hasn't been a single title to warrant the relative praise and popularity in 20 years. It's worth it then, to explore each Ghost in the Shell game, find an explanation as to why this is, and if there is one that earns the name. As said, 1997 was the year Ghost in the Shell was officially introduced to gaming in the form of a PlayStation action title called Ghost in the Shell. It was developed by Exact with assistance by Production IG, the studio that animated the 1995 film and its subsequent television adaptations. The developer only made a handful of games prior to this, but they go on to be brought into Sony's Japanese development studio that have worked on dozens of projects since. What's most notable of this PlayStation game right from the intro is how different its tone, visuals, and action is compared to the movie. That's because despite the film's popularity and this game's connection to it, the game is actually based on the manga. For those who haven't read it, the original graphic novel by Masamune Shiro is incredibly unique in presentation to this day. Whereas the film adapted the source material into a moody, atmospheric sci-fi romp, the manga is often goofy, with playful characters calling each other names in the middle of delightfully absurd scenarios. Likely, this is why the game chose the author's work over the director's. The game is incredibly simple in both gameplay and story. So rather than mesmerizing title music as we witness the creation of this new form of humanity, catchy dance music sets the stage for swinging tanks with mouths and Major Kusanagi really enjoying herself. The game's campaign has you playing a rookie of Section 9, though you're only ever referred to during cutscenes and mission briefings that exist purely to introduce each stage. The narrative is effectively non-existent and the characters have very few interactions. The film's cast reprise their roles, but all of them sound very different due to their characters being the mangas. Gameplay is of a vehicle-oriented action game, using a Fuchikoma tank from beginning to end, moving with a D-pad, firing missiles and machine gun fire, while launching the occasional grenade. As in the manga, the Fuchikama can go anywhere, climbing on walls, and being able to quickly strafe with the shoulder buttons. While Ghost in the Shell may be a PlayStation game, it's really an arcade game in disguise. The whole thing can be beaten in one hour, your score is tallied at the end of every mission, you enter your initials, multiple levels have a time limit that gets extended, and they all use the exact same structure. Complete objective, fight boss. Now, the good part of this arcade design is that the game is mostly skill-based. Those who learn the game's mechanics best can likely go through the entire game without taking a hit, as everything can be dodged, and even the toughest enemies don't take that many hits to kill. But I say mostly because there's some inherent design flaws that make getting good at this game be a chore. The most obvious problem are the controls, as the game was released prior to the DualShock controller and when developers figured out how to make a decent 3D camera system, you can only look where you're going. It becomes second nature after a while, but combine the tank's ability to climb walls with the game's camera switching to first person and claustrophobic environments, and it can be downright painful. There are many PTSD flashbacks to that underwater level in Chaser. Good instinct. God oh! damn it! <laughs> oh! God damn it! Why are my eyes watering? In being modeled as an arcade experience, there's no checkpoints. Thankfully, this can be avoided on an emulator, but it doesn't excuse things such as the final stage, where you need a platform in a game that is not designed for platforming, or else you need to redo the entire level. It also makes grinding to boss fights a real annoyance. By the time you've reached the end of the level, you know the location of objectives and enemies like the back of your hand. So to redo all of it again just to have another go at the boss you likely failed due to the game's sickening controls and sluggish frame rate rather than difficulty, the word tedious is rather polite. It just turns every level into a speed run after a while, which makes the idea of replaying missions for a higher score all the more questionable. Oddly enough, the most replayable level is the training course. The level is open, killing all of the enemies is a personal goal for the best players and not a requirement. There's less convenient health packs you can rely on, and the time limit keeps things tense. Were the rest of the game as open-ended, it would have made replaying the campaign more interesting. Because that's not to say Ghost in the Shell is bad. 
For a console-based arcade game, it does have its moments of excitement and fun. Its clunky controls and sluggish performance doesn't prevent blowing up enemy helicopters and tanks from being satisfying. Though it is odd how enemies blow up. I understand they're cyborgs, but the film and manga didn't shy away from violence. Though I'm sure it was a move to squeeze this game into a T rating to sell more copies, which only makes it more odd that it ended up featuring a VR porn ad released 20 years early. Ghost in the Shell for the PlayStation is a decent but ultimately forgettable arcade action title that hasn't aged as well as other PlayStation games due to its release, control, presentation, and replayability. It occasionally conveys a Ghost in the Shell manga feel with its cutscenes and mission briefings, but truthfully, this is a game that could have been released under any sci-fi brand. What makes it unique has nothing to do with Ghost in the Shell, but just the concept of controlling a spider tank in-game. The only recent attempt that comes to mind is the minigame from Watch Dogs, but that really does only reinforce the final point. And it'd be seven years until there was another attempt. In 2004, the development studio Kaveya had been tasked with adapting Ghost in the Shell's television spin-off, Standalone Complex, into a video game, and things appear to be far more promising. Released as a third-person shooter with acrobatic movesets, melee attacks, a selection of weapons, in-game hacking, taking over enemies, Kusanagi and Bato being fully playable, and the entire English dubbing cast reprising their roles. On paper, this game has the greatest opportunity to make the most out of its name. But even with the resources, or perhaps because of them, this game ends up suffering from even more issues than its predecessor. The brief but challenging arcade journey has been swapped with a four to six hour story campaign, launching with the Major at a shipyard that sparks an investigation for Section 9. All of the team members are heard, but oddly enough, none of them are seen except for the Major and Bato. So the game does little for newcomers. Only fans of the show will have any idea who Togasa, Aramaki, Borma, Paz, and Saito are. It's hard to feel a part of Section 9 when less than half the team is even seen, unless you count these degraded photos as an appearance. Every mission begins with a voiceover briefing, but coupled with cinematic cutscenes that follow our heroes. A story with only Kusanagi and Bato isn't an issue. It's how little is done with this setup and how poorly the story is presented that makes it hard to invest. Every mission begins with an almost identical pattern. You're given a mission briefing, followed by a cutscene setting the stage, yet when you're loaded in and ready to play, you're frozen in your tracks, treated to even more exposition by voice. When you're finally let go and ready to play, that's when the characters begin to spout more exposition, some of which is critical to understanding the plot. Drowned out by gunfire and attempting to stay alive, you're led to the conclusion that ends with an underwhelming cliffhanger for the next level. It's baffling when this first happens, it becomes ear grating by the end. Giving up on the narrative is forgivable, as the game's only attempt to engage a player beyond their objective and exposition dumps are poor attempts at either creating false tension or retooling moments from the show it's based on. Having the voice cast reprise their roles does somewhat legitimize the characters in the scenario they're in, but the dialogue gives them nothing to work with. And unlike the show that excellently characterizes them with camera angles, that's never done either, as for the reasons listed. There's even blatant misdirection with some of the cast. The Tachikomas are awesome and make even a drugged up cynic like myself want one for everyday life, but the show was walking on a very fine line. The Tachikomas could have been, with the slightest error, the most aggravating characters to listen to since Jar Jar. But because they're treated as naive but intelligent machines, there's very few scenarios where they're just high-pitched screeching, and when they were, it was usually earned and endearing. But the game does reduce them to this, making them painful to hear during missions. <laughs> There's not even a proper antagonist. The Major and Bato are chasing a ghost connected to several other cases that members like Togusa worked on as a police officer before transferring to Section 9. What has potential to intrigue quickly infuriates when you realize the entire game is spent pursuing something that you're only ever told about. Nothing of great significance happens to the Major or Bato, and the only plot element with the potential to add some tension skips what would have been dramatic and dark for something clean and cliché. What's found in the antagonist's wake doesn't elicit any reaction. Disgust, shock, fascination, etc. All you get is the final confrontation that consists of listening to the villains spew long-winded passages about their desires while you run around pressing buttons, and then the boss is killed in a cutscene, the most rewarding and purposeful of gaming experiences. Speaking of which, the story and presentation's lack of quality only puts more pressure on the gameplay. 
The Major and Bato play almost identically, with minor differences in their dodges, melee attacks, and starting equipment. By and large, the gameplay remains the same throughout, with a handful of platforming sections that are the control's downfall, and a level with the Tachikoma that lasts less than two minutes. The shooting's exactly what you'd expect from a mediocre third-person game in the age prior to everyone using Gears of War as a template. Weapons are weak, aiming's a chore, and enemies are dumb as rocks. There even seems to be a delay from when your shots hit an enemy to when they react, giving the combat a sense of being unfinished from the get-go. In fact, the whole game is an unpolished mess. For example, a small but remarkably stupid thing. The enemies you face have their own assault rifles that use the same ammo as Section 9's. So in order to pick up the enemy's weapon, you either have to be fully stocked up on ammo or spam the circle button to pick it up, or else your character grabs the ammo from the weapon on the floor and it vanishes. The game is littered with errors that'd be expected of an amateur studio, from the game's levels that consist of a shipping yard, a factory, an office, and an underground base, four of the most ubiquitous and visually dull environments in gaming, to how you have to wait 30 seconds for platforms to come to you, on-screen text taking up half the screen and even blocking your crosshairs, and the frame rate. The frame rate isn't just bad, it's bad for a very silly reason. The game doesn't look that great with blurry textures, low-quality character models outside of Kusanagi and Bato, and barren environments. So that's not the cause. Instead, it's attached to hacking and the AI. The Major, on occasion, can take direct control of enemies, and link their cyberbrain to a dead enemy, allowing you to have a real-time marker on their teammates' locations. But in order to make this mechanic, the game ends up spawning almost all AI in a level from the very start, even though the engine can't maintain it, which results in the awful performance, even if you're seemingly in an empty room. All for a mechanic that isn't very enjoyable to begin with. The markers just make the game even easier, and hacking is poorly designed because there's no repercussions for failing. The game freezes time while you're hacking, and you have an unlimited number of attempts to use it, so there's no reason not to spam the X button until you succeed. Even the audio suffers. Weapons are dull and lack impact, the voice actors sleepwalk through their roles, and the music, oh god, the music is horrendous. This is especially unfortunate when considering the source material. Kenji Kawai's main theme for the 1995 film is practically iconic, and standalone complex had Yoko Kano, the same genius behind Cowboy Bebop's score. And much like that anime, standalone complex had not only fantastic composition, but also a large variety of music. It's to be expected for quality to be lowered when the original composer isn't present, but here, the drop is vertical. Now, all this comparison from the standalone complex game to the show it's based on could give the impression that I think it's not of high quality simply by not being the show. The issue isn't that this game has made changes, or that things like the score and story don't live up to the standard set. The issue is that the show's qualities haven't been carried over, but the game doesn't use any creativity of its own to replace what's absent. It does copy the show's butt shots. That's something. Just as the PlayStation entry is simply an arcade game with a Ghost in the Shell makeover, the same applies to Standalone Complex on the PS2. It's a mediocre sixth-generation action game that happens to share the name of a beloved property. And it'd happen again. Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex for the PSP, despite sharing the same name as the previous game, isn't a port of Kaveya's PS2 effort. This time, the developer is G-Artists, also under the name Epix Incorporated, with the previous game having been made by a studio that mostly tackled small-scale projects or support work, the trend would only be furthered, with Standalone Complex and the PSP being the first game to release outside of Japan in eight years for the company behind it. But on the surface, despite being a handheld title and made by a small studio, the game is rather ambitious, especially for a title launching in the PSP's first year. Being a first-person shooter with a full story campaign, side missions, multiplayer, Tachikoma support, Kusanagi, Bato, Togusa, and Saito all being playable, and the full voice cast returning once again. At first, the game fails to impress with exposition that'll put even the most determined fan into a sleep-induced coma, but seemingly redeems itself with its structure. Rather than pre-made sets of linear missions, the game has multiple levels that can be played in any order and allow you to customize nearly everything prior to a mission, what weapons to start with, how to set up your Tachikoma, and what character you'll play as. Indeed, this is the best part of Standalone Complex. 
It's easier to get attached to Section 9 when you're tinkering with multiple parts of the team yourself, rather than being a passive viewer like you would for the show. Sadly, this glimmer of hope is buried alive by Chapter 2 in the gameplay, story, and technicals. Related to the customization, the concept is great. The execution is not so great. Firstly, the game's UI operates almost entirely on lists, ones with multiple locked items you have to scroll through just to equip what you want. Secondly, the differences in the four characters you can select from are even less noticeable than the PS2 game. Third, weapons all feel identical regardless if they're a pistol, shotgun, or machine gun. Enemies take a similar amount of hits with each, and there's few situations where a certain weapon can't get the job done. Four, the Tachikomas are virtually unstoppable, at least in the levels I played. There weren't any situations where I had to be cautious or strategize with it. And fifth, the game's design is all over the place. The missions you partake in are typically very short, dull, and rushed, which speaks to the game's handheld nature. Levels are brief, presumably, to allow players to boot up their system, play a couple minutes, and be able to stop. But then you have cutscenes that test Kojima's patience, with some running for 11 minutes straight. Once again, the gameplay is all that's left to carry the package, and with the amount of issues already listed, it only continues. Controls and AI are awful, as to be expected with a handheld shooter, featuring lackluster weapons that'd be more appropriate with a Fisher-Price tag, levels more cliché and barren than its predecessor, and objectives that are about as exciting as the locations they take place in. Sound effects are either flat or lifted from familiar games, and while the soundtrack is occasionally decent, an overabundance of missions use horrific melodies that loop ad nauseum. Playing through this game really was torture, until the emulator refused to go any further. Even in the category of first-person shooters for the PSP, there are better options. Medal of Honor Heroes is the obvious answer, but even in the same year of 2005, Konami's coded arms had done a superior job. With low sales and little reception to the games at this point in time, Ghost in the Shell standalone complex kept going with second gig and the feature-length conclusion, Solid State Society, with no more gaming tie-ins. After 2008, the franchise as a whole had taken a break and finally resurfaced in 2013 with Ghost in the Shell Arise. The series established itself with four hour-long episodes that capped off with a feature film. Yet, when a new Ghost in the Shell video game was announced, it had been attached to the previous series, standalone complex. First Assault Online was the subtitle. Developed by Neopol, a subsidiary of popular Asian game publisher Nexon, it's a free-to-play multiplayer team-based FPS, allowing people to play as all the active members of Section 9, including some never seen before. Most of the cast has returned more than 10 years later, with some notable exceptions such as Togusa. Unlike the previous standalone complex games, this one doesn't attempt anything beyond its grasp. There's no single player or story mode, it's purely an online shooter with three game modes and a selection of levels. Gameplay is left to hold its own, but this time with purpose, not because everything else is a letdown. To anyone that's experienced with free-to-play Korean shooters, you'll feel right at home. The movement and gunplay is very similar to the plethora of shooters, very obviously inspired by Counter-Strike and Call of Duty. More so the latter in this case. The movement's a tad stiff, as is reloading an ADS, but the controls are something you get the hang of quickly. You don't so much move in this game as you dash, sprinting from one area to the next, stopping and aiming while the enemy is still running. Because there is no time to transfer from one action to the next if you're caught under fire. Deaths in this game are lightning fast, and with weapons that are laser precise. Similar to Call of Duty, this results in assault rifles and submachine guns being the weapons of choice, and the shotguns and snipers being very situational and putting you at a disadvantage. Just like the games it's inspired by, the combat is able to generate a sense of excitement when going on a streak. Facing three enemies and taking them down by yourself does have a certain gratification. These may be cheap thrills, but thrills nevertheless. Thankfully, there's at least one extra layer on top of this gameplay. While all the characters may feel very similar to play in regards to speed and shooting, they each have a unique ability. 
The Majors is active camouflage, obviously, Bato's a rocket launcher, Saito's radar, Borma's health regeneration, and the list continues. This may sound very similar to perks or specializations from Call of Duty, but there is a twist that separates them. When an ability is activated, teammates within a certain range are able to use the same ability without using up any of their own energy. It creates an interesting dynamic where upon, say, camouflage, you traverse the level not only to sneak past enemies, but to allow as many teammates as possible to sync up to you. It's admittedly gimmicky, but positively rather than negatively. The combat has its fair share of satisfaction with exploding heads and limbs, but timing your abilities just right so that your teammates steamroll the enemy is just as enjoyable. Sadly, this is the only dose of originality the game presents. Everything else is something that's been done in multiplayer shooters before, and done better. By this point, I'm beginning to think that unoriginal or visually muted locations will forever curse all video games with a Ghost in the Shell name. Just for reference, this is the opening shot of the film. The animation's renowned for its astounding visuals. The final battle has some of the grittiest but gorgeous looking imagery put to animation in maybe film. Standalone Complex is unrivaled in TV anime production. Even Arise, with its weaker direction in cinematography, has lots of beautiful lighting and locations. Why a Ghost in the Shell game in the modern day refuses to move beyond brown and gray factories, alleys, markets, and streets is beyond me. But what's of a much greater annoyance than the level's appearance is their design. Free-to-play shooters from Asia seem to have levels copy-pasted from game to game. Consisting of long corridors with no cover, spawns that can only be camped harder with an actual tent and fire, and layouts flat enough to make Manitoba look like Everest. There's no strategy in deathmatch. Just center your screen consistently and hope your teammates are just as good at that. Terminal Conquest and Demolition are just modes copied from Call of Duty and Counter-Strike. Terminal Conquest echoes war from World at War, and Demolition is... Demolition, or Search and Destroy. Terminal Conquest has the potential to be a little more interesting with the inclusion of the Tachikomas, but frankly, they're more annoying than anything else. Barely anyone selects Bato in the roster, so the only way to take care of these things is to spam grenades and shoot it to your empty, or hack it. It degenerates the mode into either tedious tug-of-wars with little excitement or strategy, or a boring steamroll with a team that can't control its objective with a high-pitched spider tank messing them up. And then there's the inevitable free-to-play unlock system and microtransactions. Credit where credit is due, this game is actually pretty generous when it comes to giving you in-game resources. There's plenty of rewards that aren't that much of a grind to earn, you earn healthy bonuses just for logging in, and if you're lucky, you can get $200,000 credits granted to you in a single loot drop. 200,000 sounds like a lot, but it isn't. Because while the game is kind with how much it gives you, it's sleight of hand, because everything in this game costs more than Ferraris made out of diamonds. That 200,000 will maybe get you four gun attachments, which only makes the robustness and depth of the weapon customization even more questionable. The UI in general feels rather manipulative and designed to make the player impatient and keep them locked to the screen even when they're sick of it. The daily login bonuses are great, what isn't is having to go through three separate screens just to finally activate what you earned. First Assault Online was actually my introduction to Ghost in the Shell. I previewed its early access build on COD Connected years ago. Let's just say I didn't much care for it back then. But I will say it has grown on me with time. I can say that it's a decent game, and does what it attempts to do adequately. But that's just it. Ghost in the Shell isn't special when it's adequate. Nothing is. And at the end of the day, highlights the overarching problem with all of these games. In the latest English edition of the manga, there's a wonderfully written postscript by its creator, Mazumune Shiro. In its final paragraphs, the author says, and I quote, The manga of the Ghost in the Shell didn't place importance on its sustainability as a series, because it is faithful to the idea that works in different media, be it film, TV series, manga, or novel, should each be optimized to its own art form. This philosophy can be seen in each iteration of Ghost in the Shell. There isn't one correct, canon, or true version. All are Ghost in the Shell. The manga, Oshi's film, standalone complex, even Arise, the weakest of these iterations, has its own unique and fascinating ideas when at its best. At its peak, Ghost in the Shell simultaneously combines the most advanced engineering with top-notch artistry to visually stun audiences while delivering a narrative that's simple in structure but complex in its implications and ideas. The games do none of these things. 
They're not pushing systems to their limits, at least not for good reasons. They're not beautiful, they're not engaging in story or ideas, but most importantly, they are not a unique imagining of the source material. They don't take advantage of video games as an art form. They're ghost in the shell products in the same way that action figures or slot machines are. Even the standalone complex novels understand Shiro's point. Using the novel art form to tell a story that while taking place in the same universe as the television show is noticeably darker than the first season and even second gig with imagery that likely wouldn't fly on a rated television show but is acceptable in print. The games on the other hand follow whatever genre is popular and within budget, task an unknown studio with making it, add a gimmick or two, throw in a cyberbrain map, and release it. In fact, the closest there's been to a Ghost in the Shell game doesn't share the name, but makes quite obvious parallels. Oni, Bungie's PS2 and PC flop, is their title from 2001 that didn't sell consoles, evolve a genre, arguably change an industry, or make Microsoft a gazillion dollars. It can seemingly be called a Ghost in the Shell game when you're playing as a purple-haired augmented secret police officer led by an old guy with a bad haircut kicking the asses of cyberized villains. While aspects of its gameplay have aged like warm milk and the levels are barren enough to make the titles we looked at earlier seem like human revolution by comparison, its gameplay in detail is far more original and ambitious than any of the official games. The amount of fighting moves and animations is still impressive 16 years later and really spits in the face of standalone complex on the PS2 with its canned animations. But while Oni has the setup of Ghost in the Shell, its story is not at all made in the same vein. The game is told with both cutscenes and text logs you find throughout the levels. However, the team at Bungie West didn't have the cinematic eye that Bungie's core team on Halo did, and thus doesn't share the well-directed cinematics of Halo. But because the story is told through cutscenes, the text logs don't have the significance or player involvement that they did in Marathon, so it ends up being a lose-lose situation. But then again, by the time I was running in circles pressing buttons 12 times to disable a giant brain getting ready to do bad things, I was just about done. The bottom line is this. In five games over 20 years, there's never been a Ghost in the Shell game. Not really. At this point, they've all been products. Lazy, minimal, tacked on. For a Ghost in the Shell game to truly earn its name, it needs to not only be of high quality in gameplay, story, and ideas. It needs to, in the words of its creator, be optimized for its own art form. I want to take the time to give an extra special thank you to my patrons. This is the first video I've ever done where I needed to actually purchase things for it. In this case, having to go through three different online orders until I finally got a copy of Ghost in the Shell on the PS2, as well as an adapter for the console so I could record it for my capture card. Without your support, this video would not have been able to get made, or at the very least be far less detailed. So thank you, and this could not have happened without you guys, and I'm always grateful for your support. What inspired you to become an in-depth game reviewer? I really only realized this in retrospect, but it was likely after watching Matthew Matosis and Super Bunny Hop analyze the Metal Gear games and thinking to myself, why isn't there something like this for the Halo series? And I've been pretty much at it ever since. Is it true that if your hand is larger than your face, you have cancer? No, it means you're in Star Trek. Before you get excited, JJ's Star Trek. If a race of it could rake racing rays on race of rage of street, would the rays race be too racy for Victor? Eat a dick. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Fight me. There is a button in front of you. You don't know what it does. Do you push it? Fuck yeah! Are you ever gonna sell merch like a god church? Give it time. Give it time. If you could go back in time and meet anyone, who would it be? Probably Philip K. Dick. Just because I know that whether the conversation is pleasant or not, I would have a very different perspective on the world. How do you feel about Little Pump's music? You're fucking idiot. This needs to stop now. Finding out a galaxy, a planet, and stars within me. Listening to each 
of him singing the same silent melody. 